You're listening to Honey, We Made a Disney Podcast. Two friends since refining our negotiating skills, making lunch table trades, now guides on your nostalgic tour of Disney history, one magical film at a time. I'm J.B. Wagner. And I'm Eddie Ferguson. And on today's episode, we find out who's the leader of the club that's made for you and me as we review the first episode of the Mickey Mouse Club. So fasten that safety restraint and pull up on the yellow strap. It's time to open the vault. Cue that Disney sound effect. M-I-C-K-E-Y-M-O-U-S-E. Could, could not go any farther without singing that song, <laughs> which I'm pretty sure I was singing incorrectly for a long time. I feel like as I was trying to sing along with it, I was like, I think I'm singing the wrong lyrics, like other than spelling the name, which I barely got right. Uh, I think I think I had weird. I don't even remember what the lyrics I was. I was like, I'm not I don't know any of these. There's a ton more here. Well, and I also have distinct memories. My dad would always take the role of Donald Duck and I never Donald Duck. I don't I'd only heard kind of like the more like theme park versions of the song, things like that. Um. But yeah, dad, of, of course, would have known the Mickey Mouse uh, Club, maybe. Um, this is a little beyond his time. But uh, yeah, he would always do the Donald Duck, Donald Duck. I had never seen it before. Before what? Like, like actually sitting down and watching it. This was my first time watching it. How about you? Uh, I've seen clips. This is uh, also for me. First time watching an episode top to bottom. I don't know if it was it was it what you were expecting it to be or was it different? Um, it, um, yeah. I mean, I knew it was a musical review show. I wasn't prepared. I didn't know there were so many other segments. I thought the show was predominantly like the Mouseketeers doing like variety acts. Um, so the newsreel from around the world that was kind of. Oh, okay. Well, all right, that makes sense. And then, like, um, probably my favorite segment was the like special agent for the Mickey Mouse Club going out recruiting children, um, which isn't creepy in 1955. But uh, when I say it with a 2024 perspective, it's like, <laughs> yeah, that's set. That sounds really creepy. Um, so yeah, like some other little pieces and bits in there like that. Um, uh, that took me off guard. I was not prepared for that. I can guess what your favorite section was. I'm guessing it was all the news reels, the world <laughs> reports around the world. I do like news reels. I miss that. Uh, I miss that. Like I was actually alive during those times. Um, I, I, I like, I've always liked that. Even like the old movies when they would have that. That was a weird s sequence when uh, they're kind of jumping from uh, recording to recording to recording on in Burbank. Uh, then they have this random in Tokyo, this swim meet that this guy is filming for some apparent reason. I don't really know what is going he filming. On. I think he's filming it for the Mickey Mouse Club. Yes. So I don't totally like, I loved why. how they were news in their own news segment. <laughs> <laughs> you're right because there was also the, they were also like and at the sound stages in burbank the mouseketeers are recording a number and i'm like we haven't even been introduced to the mouseketeers I know, yet. right like, how is this news yeah but then of course then they go oh they do their thing but then they have their uh swim party afterwards so then there's yeah, like a yeah. a a, a, a childhood you're like swim party that's happening with all these kids oh, hold on like th you're at the beginning of the very first episode of this tv show like we we have no idea what you're talking about and no clue what's going uh, on <laughs> no clue what's going on this would make more sense maybe in episode two but um what i didn't realize is the mickey mouse club was on five days a week i mean that's this a is a that's a lot that's a lot um, I mean, even like your late night guys these days, they only do like four nights a week. They don't mm -hmm. do um, always, you know, five days a week. So 
has a lot of content. So of course, yeah, you're going to need, you're going to need some filler segments. You're going to need, you know, people staring up into the corner of a room, pretending that they're seeing an airplane for <laughs> way too long. <laughs> for way too long that whole sequence was just alvy moore the special agent for the mickey mouse club <laughs> he they go on he's just like wandering around a uh, recruiting children <laughs> recruiting children that that like are pretending to be twa agents uh or uh uh hostesses uh, flight yeah flight, flight, att flight attendant yeah. uh and then you got that little kid, and then you got the boy, Duncan, I've got no time for kid games. <laughs> then he just starts saying, hey, what's that up there? Yeah, you don't see it either. And then that tricks him. And then that does the whole, that, that's good. He's, he's good from then on. Um, and, then, and then her line. And we get no resolution on it. No you resolution know, like, whatsoever. Oh, I'm going to have to, I guess, tune in next week. Maybe. Maybe we should, maybe we should have watched more of these episodes. <laughs> but then the little girl like... Sometimes I think boys are nothing but children. Mm -hmm. There we go. There we go. Yeah, there was all this. This this show was all over the place. I, it was both uh, very different from what I think I thought it was going to be, and also, yeah, that's about right. They would have random, random, uh, random news segments. Uh, we get a whole dance routine uh, for a really long time there in the middle. Um, with the drawing of, of shoes with faces. Yep. Uh, oh, and this is interesting. Uh, you, hold on, hold on. Before we move on from that, um, did you feel... <laughs> before we move on from people from dancing about shoes yeah. and him drawing pictures, did you not have a little bit of a flashback with him on his like big easel with the chalk like um, evangelism oh, drawings? yeah. Do you know mm -hmm. what I'm talking about? Whereas yeah. like, oh, what is he drawing? You know, and it's like music going and and then all of a sudden, oh, it's the face of Jesus. Oh, we turned uh, on a black light and now we got a whole nother oh, image here. Yeah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so this is that's what I was thinking the whole time is like, is Jesus' face going to appear in this when, show? When, when does this become the message? When, 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 yes. when, when, when is this going to happen in here? Um. <laughs> Okay, so the Mouseketeers, uh, just wanted to throw this little fun fact out to you. I should have done a little bit more research here and maybe gotten a name or something. But Stu, who we've talked about, a uh, family friend, uh, he, uh, gave, he, he helped us get a bike for my son a couple yeah. of years ago when we were looking to buy a real bike on a very shady website that was real, but it hadn't been updated since 2001, except with inventory. That's a whole other thing you can go back and listen to all of our old episodes for that. Anyways, his mom was a was an original Mouseketeer. No, she's somewhere in there, and I foolishly did not like text him right before we were recording this to get more additional details about it. But yeah, she's some she's one of the girls in in the cast that original cast, and I I I didn't look to see who which one she would have been. Wow. That's crazy. Yeah. I, I mean, the, um, the show is known for the Mouseketeers, right? Like when you, mm -hmm. when you think of the Mickey Mouse Club, I think the first thing people think of is the theme song, of course. And then second of all would be like, oh yeah, with the Mouseketeers and the roll call and, and different things like that. The, the, um, the theme song is also the last thing you forget. Because it's yes. like over and over and over. <laughs> yes. That's a really long intro. But there was a lot of, di well, because you've got to fill, uh, what, an hour's worth of TV five days a week. So it's like, let's just make this theme song nice and long because that'll do it. Get her, um, you basically start it and get to the first commercial break by the end of it. Yes. There's a lot of well-known people from this the the early um segment of uh the early run of the Mickey Mouse Club that were Mouseketeers. Um most notably, I know like Mickey Rooney. Um he goes on to be a pretty famous star. Um there is also uh what is her name here? Oh, I have her written down. Annette Funicello. Um Annette 
uh, she becomes like the, one of the biggest stars in the 1960s. She's kind of like the one that holds down all of the, the beach movies. Um, she is an original Mouseketeer um, uh, during this time. So, yeah, I mean, there's there, there's a lot of Mouseketeers, right? And it cycled every season and there was others. Some spun off and had like their own show. Um, which I thought was interesting was also in that newsreel, like the boys at Golden Oak fighting sequence that becomes a <laughs> spinoff. And I'm going, okay, I, I had done the research before about some of this. And so when I was watching it and I go, wait a second, that's like the spinoff. Like you're already planning a spinoff. Okay. All right. That doesn't make any sense, but. But then it goes on to, uh, in the 90s or 80, 90s is where we get a lot of uh, Mouseketeers that end up being Yeah, famous. so l- let me back up here a little bit and, and put all of this together. So the original, original Mickey Mouse Clubs started actually in the 1930s. Um, this became a popular thing within movie theaters uh, in New York and in California. And uh, by the end of 1930, there was over 60 theaters throughout the United States that hosted these clubs. Um, and you would get um, like an actual bulletin from the Mickey Mouse Club. And in essence, what you would do is get together on Saturdays and go watch a Mickey Mouse short at your local theater together. Like they, they created this um, and then they can sell ads in the bulletin and different things like that. By 1932, there were over 1 million members of Mickey Mouse clubs throughout the United States. Wow. So this that's the that's the 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 roots of this. Right. Like that's the the core idea. Um, All right. So making building a club around Mickey Mouse has has somewhat of a proven track record. Then we come back to this theme that we've talked about in these past two episodes now between the Disneyland story and Davy Crockett. Walt Disney is going headfirst into this new medium of television and everybody is just on a race to create content. So Walt comes up with this idea of like, why don't we create like a variety show of kids? And that's what gets started. That. This is where this comes from. He gets a couple of like key songwriters and artists to kind of help lead and produce the show who are actually the Mouseketeers. I don't know how they pronounced it. Like Jimmy and and Roy, the the two tall guys where you're like, wait, are those full grown men in the middle of the Mouseketeers there? (laughs) (laughs) Um, And then... Yeah, I mean, this is this is huge. This is massive. This goes on for four years, uh, highly successful. The only reason it doesn't go past the four year run is just a contract dispute with ABC. It ends because Disney ends all TV partnership with ABC um, because of contract disputes. Yeah, like he only has about a four year relationship, four or five year relationship with ABC. Wow. Uh, and so it dies off. It's in syndication for a while. They bring it back in the 70s. And there's like a disco version. You need to look up the photos. Um, I haven't found video clips yet. But there's a disco version of uh, of the theme song. And then the one we all know about, the 90s, which we'll circle back to. Then I didn't know about this, but there was a briefly lived... Uh, social media only version of the Mickey Mouse Club in 2017 and 18. Whoa. Didn't didn't register. Had no idea. Had no idea that existed. So, yeah, that's like the full flyover of the Mickey Mouse Club, um, as it were. That is crazy. And then when that's where we really get a lot of those famous people that we know from 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 our from our time. Like, uh, yeah, and famously. So, so I would say like the Mickey Mouse Club, starting back with the original and then definitely here with the 90s one. This is the birth of the what we now know as like the Disney kid star. Yes. I mean, yes, you had them in the movies and there's definitely some that are like particular like Disney, you know, movie kid stars. 
Yeah. But I think when we think of it today, we think of it like the Disney Channel kind of kid stars, like your Demi Lovato, Jonas Brothers stuff. Like we rattled off at the end of, of last week's episode, right? Where we were going through the most successful um, and we both were quite perturbed that Hillary Duff apparently is the most uh, famous one of them all, which don't know. Makes no sense. Um, so do you have a list of of all the, the 90s ones? Because the, the show that came out, I think it was like 89, 90 was when it premiered and ran for three, four years. It was like the all new Mickey Mouse Club or, or some type of title like that. It was just chocked full of people who are now the a-lists of of hollywood i mean some of the few ones here is britney spears ryan gosling christina aguilera justin timberlake and carrie russell just to Mm -hmm. name uh, just to name a few like it's insane just even that lineup oh jc uh chat uh jc yep jc also from from nsync yep uh, Nikki Deloach, I've seen her before. I just can't remember. Uh, there's there's plenty of other people, but those are like the crazy big list of like I- icons, not just like some like no, these are just incredible icons of the especially of the music industry. But even like Ryan Gosling, I always forget that he was in there too, um, and bloomed a little bit later than everybody else, but. Man, mm-hmm. like, and and we're still, and we still have seen it even since then. Like we said, Demi Lovato, um, and and other and other people, like especially just music, like just something about that, like where they go on to Isn't do that a lot of music. Like I, I find that fascinating, and and I, yeah, you would, ass- I guess I would assume it would be like movie stars, it would be actors, but it the 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 amount of of musical talent that has come out because. All of the, even from the early ones, I had mentioned Annette previously, like, yes, she was really known for the beach movies in the 60s, but she had several, like, number one records that came out afterwards. Like, her, she was more known for her, um, her musical career. Uh, and there was a couple other young ladies uh, with that uh, initial class that also went on to have quite a large um, music career. Yeah, so th- it's crazy how that thing in all its different iterations has had an impact no matter kind of where it's been, even just starting off. And I, if I believe correctly, Disney didn't initially originate the Mickey mouse club. It was like an organic um, thing just happening with the fans that they then realized was this blossoming thing that they could take advantage of, like in a good, like in nothing like sinister, but like, Hey, if these people are doing it, why don't we start supplying them with materials and hat and and uh and t-shirts and merch and other things like that and they, that's that's really how they they've grown a whole industry with with their um merchandising and stuff um but uh also from this group in the 19 what, in the 1930s version yeah the like mm-hmm. the early version of the club yeah was exactly organic. before before it became the show and everything else but like the the roots of it like you said was came from the theaters but that was organic it wasn't necessarily initially disney heading it up they just kind of caught the wave and and wrote it uh but you had found that um yeah so yeah so interesting this little this little show and it's funny that it only lasted four years i thought it would have been like a longer term um thing yeah it goes on like it's heavily syndicated from here on out so it's like aired for a really long time okay um but the but yeah the initial run of it is only is only a four-year run um and i i feel a bit like a broken record and 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 maybe i i i'm stumbling on a a thought that i I couldn't find any articles on but there's there's got to be a part where some Disney historian far more educated than 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 you or I could there's come back and then kind of there's not that many there's not many but like 1955 I mean is this the most influential year for Disney like it seems like such a seismic uh shift like yes you've got Snow White and you've got the impact on movies but 1955 is the year that two things happen that Disney does 
that make it the household name in American culture. They open theme parks, which I mentioned last week, 83% of all Americans will go to a Disney theme park in their life. That's crazy. That is arguably the most thing, common thing we have. Yep. Um, second of all, they take over TV. Like, You've got with the Disney, uh, you know, Disneyland Presents, which becomes the wonderful world of Disney eventually. Like, that's the second longest running TV show in history. And then the Mickey Mouse Club, which just becomes, okay, Disney owns children's programming is in essence what happens there. It's like they are are at the forefront of creating it. These are, are pretty massive, significant, you know, things that happen that will define the Disney company uh, uh, even till today, right? So that's where I'm, I'm looking at this going. 55 just feels like such a significant uh, year. And it's around some stuff where like we would not have hopped on and, and, and watched this if we weren't doing this silly exercise of... of our vanity project <laughs> podcast here. Um, <laughs> and this but is like looking back at it and you go like those don't stand the test of time like Snow White does. But the what they created within the culture, like their deeper impact has probably had just as if not greater of an impact than Snow White. It's the sneaky impact. Sure. The big sneaky impact. And this is 20 to 30 years after their initial, the, after Steamboat Willie and after, and like 18 years after Snow White, like they are reinventing themselves um, in real time into completely new areas of parks and television, which aren't, aren't necessarily like the um, immediate next right answer to making no. move, making animated films. Well, and we talk about Walt Disney, the man, as this innovator, risk taker, you know, he's kind of now just become mythological, right? Yep. In, in the American psyche. Well, when we talk about like these massive risks or, you know, dreaming about things that nobody else is thinking about, these are the two we're talking about. Television, and theme parks these were the two that he was laughed out of hollywood for that people thought he's losing his mind he's building trains in his backyard like what what's going on with this guy like they honestly thought there was something mentally wrong with him and there was only a select few of people around him who believed he was at the forefront of something and and even now to like go back and you look at it I kind of go, really? Like that would that was it? You know, like Davy Crockett, okay, Mickey Mouse Club. Even your original what was at Disneyland when it opened isn't anything compared to, you know, uh the big, you know, attractions that you see today. But they caught, right? He he saw something bigger than just the the here and the now. He knew what they would grow into becoming, which I think for me, like that's the the admirable aspect of it all. Any other highlights from the show itself? The one episode we watched, you said you 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 tried to you you said we should try to watch the newer version. There's there's a newer version of well, this, I'm, or are you talking about twenty? I meant the nineteen nine the nineties version. Like I would oh, okay. love to find uh, one with like Britney Spears and Christine yeah. Christina Aguilera and all them. Like that would be really fun. Um, I. I it's not on Disney Plus, and I didn't have the time to like really track one down. Um, I think there's there's um, a couple of significant things here. One, Walt returns to Mickey in the Mickey Mouse Club. So Mickey uh, Walt was the original voice of Mickey. He stops voicing Mickey for all of the uh, theatrical shorts and all of those things for quite some time. Um, like in the late 30s, early 40s, he just stops voicing Mickey and another guy steps in to do that. For the Mickey Mouse Club, he comes back and he starts voicing Mickey for some of those intro, outro things that you have Mickey and yeah. Pluto and different things like that. That's Walt's voice. And I think that's a, a nice little 
um, tidbit uh, of information there. Also, I mentioned them before, Jimmy and Roy, the the two awkward, fully grown men who are also Mouseketeers. <laughs> uh -huh. Like, they're the writers and producers. Like, Jimmy is the guy who wrote the uh, theme song that uh, we all, like, you know, love. Uh, Roy is the uh, production designer. Like, they're actually writing and producing the show uh, along with starring in it through it all. So I think that's... Um, Kind of a, an interesting little tidbit. And maybe if we're ready, we can talk about influence in the parks because Roy had an idea there that is still being seen in the parks today. Yes, I'm, 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 all, I'm all ears for the study. Nice transition. I like what you did there. Uh, it was Roy who had the idea that the Mouseketeers should wear... Mickey ears. So it is here with this first episode of the Mickey Mouse Club with this art production designer, Roy, that we get the very first Mickey ears, like the hat and many ears, which now generates millions of dollars for the Walt Disney Company, right? Like they sell a pair of ear, you know, like nice mini ears is like, $38 or and up um, that and and originates here. And I think that's uh, an interesting little tidbit of of information there that the, the Mickey ears, which have kind of become a, a, an iconic souvenir, like you go to Disney World, like and sometime uh, Disneyland, like I, I know, like when I went to Disneyland with you all for the first time, like I felt I was like, I have to get a Disneyland pair of ears, you know, it's like, this is just what you do. You, you get yourself some mini ears and you get your name written on the back of it and everything. I, at first I was, uh, thinking, well, wait, they had some of that prior to this. Cause there's an older photo. Um, that's the classic, like it's got the entire theater just full of Mickey faces, but those are like Mickey faces. What you're saying faces. is like the ears like the, the dome hat, hat with the ears. That's where this is originating. Yeah. So uh, the Roy guy, um, and I, I didn't write down his last name. I'm not, don't confuse it with Roy Disney. Um, he saw a 1940s short of Mickey where Mickey in the short just kind of like tips his ears to somebody and they come off of his head in that shape. And he goes, oh, we should make hats like this for the Mouseketeers. Man. And boom. That's a whole, in, that's a whole industry in of itself is just those, those hats and making your custom hats and getting custom headbands and stuff. Yeah, I, I think that uh, unless there, it's a subculture, right? Like it, it yep. helps create like this Disney subculture. You, you have to have the Disney uh, headwear, you know, you've got your your hats, your ears, even like it's grown more like I remember as a kid going in the 90s, the goofy hat or the, the oh, Donald that hat. goofy hat. Yeah, like I still have my goofy hat. And, you know, I've told Sarah, like, OK, next time we go with the boys, like I want to get a, a goofy, a Donald and a Pluto hat and all three <laughs> of us boys are wearing, you know, these around Disney. Um, and she's like, okay, you know, me and Ellie will get, uh, we'll get mini ears. Okay. You know? Um, yeah, this, the headwear, like Disney, like Mickey ears, mini ears comes from this very first episode of the Mickey Mouse Club. Man. Any other final party, parting words for this iconic show, Eddie? Um, I feel like we do we sing the the ending of the song the I'm sure we'll do that we'll later. We'll see you real soon. I'm sure I'm sure it'll pop up later. Uh, mm -hmm. We rating this. It's it's a show, but are we are we going to rate this? We rated Probably. the other shows, so I, I feel like we should. But this okay. one just feels more awkward to rate. Why does it feel awkward, Eddie? What's what's got you put back to the corner? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Um, it's not one that you're like, 
Oh man, I I want to go put on an episode of the Mickey Mouse Club, right? No, or, not at or all. Or were you? Not a, not at all. I the the lore around it was much greater than the actual yes. experience of sitting down and watching it. Uh, it was it. There were still moments where I was like, oh yeah, maybe if, if I was a little kid, I probably would have been. And this is all that's on. I probably would have been into this, like. Kind of take you around the world a little bit, have different different sketches and comedies, and then there's the the cartoon. But it's it's kind of a hot mess of random. It's like a stew of random ideas, and I I'm so curious. It, I don't really want to watch a bunch more of these, but it'd be interesting to see do they continue that or do they evolve over the next couple over over the over the few years that they're doing it. Um, yeah. The experience. I definitely skipped through a lot of this. I definitely like fast forward uh, a lot of it. I did not just sit and watch it all together. I'm glad I watched it. I'm. I think it's again we're it's a part of our Disney education. We can say we're well informed Disney fans. Now. Watch a double speed. Um, <laughs> <laughs> double speed through it's it. Not, it's not a podcast. Um, that's where I think I would give it a. The same as as uh, as David Crockett. I would just give it a two. Just be like, okay, this was interesting. I'm glad I watched it. If you're a big Disney fan, I think you should watch one episode just to kind of go, oh, okay, that's that's what the Mickey Mouse Club was. I keep going back and forth on this. Uh, I feel bad, but I really don't have any desire to watch this again. I was like, glad I took one for the team but i think i'm just gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna usher it back to its seat in the vault and be like there you go little little thing there you go back back to your home go back go back you're, to your home i'm gonna go to a one you're just reinforcing what your teammate said about how i'm the positive one and you're the negative one in this <laughs> podcast relationship michaela yeah, our our number our number number one fan, Michaela, who's not family. Their number one non family 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 fan. Hey, is that our fan? <laughs> our our one fan. But shout um, out to Nancy who now listens to our podcast, who now watches our our show. So like she just discovered it, like all of a sudden. Oh, like this. Oh, is, hey, that, thanks, mom. We've only <laughs> been doing this for several years now. So. <laughs> Well, there you go. Hopefully you are filled up on some Disney nostalgia. So now it is time for a bit of Disney news. We've been trickling out the the news stories from that earnings call a couple of weeks ago now, um, anticipating that it might be a few slow weeks of news. Um, And I think this is the last little bit that we've held out for. JB, I know you're a Big Swifty. So I'm going to toss this one over to you. Huge, huge Swifty. Can't even describe for you how how much of a Swifty fan I am. It's well, just, we all hear the insane. enthusiasm in your voice. Oh, it's palpable. All my, yeah, I just I can't get enough of it. Anyways, uh, so the Eras tour, which came to theaters. <laughs> I think it made a, almost a hundred million dollars in its in its opening weekend, um, mm-hmm. in theaters and its direct direct to theater release. No studio releasing it at all. Just T Swizzle doing it herself. So it's finally coming to Disney Plus, which is awesome. Is coming uh, March fifteenth. So here in just a few short weeks, uh, my house will be raining, raining Taylor. All day, every day. I'm sure. I'm for for the foreseeable future. I'm I'm already envisioning it. If it's not already queued up, it's it's ready to go. Yeah. So we're only a couple, um, yeah, about two, a little over two weeks left uh, until that's going to be coming to Disney Plus. Um, are you guys gonna? Are you queuing it up for yourself? I know you watch a lot more music um, centric content. On yeah, Plus. I uh, uh, we've enjoyed. Um, yeah, uh, music centric. Um, the what are they like kind of music docu series and stuff like that? Yeah. I don't know if this is more of a docu series or it's just a straight up concert. Um, we also enjoy doing that as well. Like, we'll often have like at home date nights where we just 
pull up a concert on YouTube or, or something. Um, I think it'll be something we eventually watch just because the Eras tour has been everywhere. Like everybody yeah. is talking about this. This is so significant. So it feels like one of those things where you like kind of have to at least watch some of it to understand it. Um, I've I've never gotten hooked on Taylor Swift music. I've got a, a, a few that I've enjoyed. I have nothing against I watched one of her other documentaries that I think is on Disney Plus. I can't remember the name Hope of it. Four. Maybe. Um, <laughs> sure. Uh, why not? Sure. I just like watching music documentaries. There is something intriguing to me about watching people's creative processes. Um, that's probably what I watch them for more than anything. So, um, yeah, uh, I mean, we'll definitely be watching this, but. Probably not when it first comes out. Yeah, let's save it for a special moment, special occasion. Yeah. March 15th. Now, here we go. Now I've got to look this up. Is that Taylor Swift's birthday? Because I know her birthday is close to mine. If you are a Taylor Swift fan, can you call They're in? They're screaming to tell at us? the. Yeah. Hey. Let's see. No, it's no, in December. totally, no, it's, totally it's, it's off, no, totally it's off. Liter- <laughs> nowhere near, nowhere near. I'm an idiot. I'm an idiot. <laughs> December thirteenth. Thirteenth. <laughs> it was really close on the I number. I could not Eddie. have been more close on wrong. That number. <laughs> Why did I think that? There was something that. Never mind. Let's move on to the next story and forget that I speaking even did of that. numbers. Being I would wrong. say cut it out, but I know you would not cut that out. That's no, I'm not going to cut that. Too out. embarrassing. Yeah. Speaking of numbers, um, Disney World has released that. Uh, hey, ticket prices are going up. Yay! Because why not? Because uh, why not? Let's make everything. But the biggest thing is that they are increasing. This was like so random. They the the pricing they've made it so complex. But for the first time since 2018, the cheapest possible ticket, like some random day in the end of March or something at Animal Kingdom, has always been like the cheapest ticket at $109. So when you get on the website, it says tickets from $109 and up, you know. So everybody's like, oh, 109 is like nothing is available 109 Never. that bottom number now goes up to 119 so the cheapest possible ticket you can get but across the board you're seeing on average price increases from five to ten dollars i thought this was interesting this is happening in 2025 i thought this was interesting because to soften the news and what you really saw at the headlines and this is really the subtitle to it all but the headlines is Disney World is now introducing a water park perk for visitors who book a Disney resort hotel in 2025. You get a mission, free admission to one of the two Disney World water parks on your check-in day. If it's your check-in day, you can go to one of those uh, water parks for free. So there you go. Don't ever well, say Disney never gave me anything for free. Well, that it it makes sense because normally you're not you're not choosing to go to the park on your check in day. Right. Because usually that's the day you've been traveling. You fly you're in, in in the afternoon. Yeah. yeah. So it makes sense to be like, well, what's one thing that people would want to do on that first day? Hey, let's just go to let's go to the pool. Let's go hang Let's out go, there. Go down some water slides for, you know, two hours or so. And if you get them away from their hotel, a hotel room where they might have snacks and foods and nothing like that, get them away from there, get them to uh, into the park, then you can get more of their money through food and merchandising and other things like that. So it it makes sense. And I don't know how many places or how many people would actually take advantage of it, but it's not like they could be... It doesn't seem like a losing losing proposition at all. And I think that's what you've stumbled on right there is it looks it looks good. OK, mm-hmm. we're giving you something. It's uh, they've took away so many of the on site resort benefits 
I mean, there used to be a lot, and now those have just slowly been chipped away, and everybody loves to complain about them. So now this just kind of like throws, they're not probably going to lose much on doing, you know, lose much money on doing this, and it gains them a lot of goodwill, some good PR, um, which they need, especially you bury the news that, oh, yeah, well, we did this by, you know, increasing ticket prices or whatever. Um but you get to go to a water park for free. Hey, 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 look over here. Um, it, it works. It's a good PR move on them. Yep. Uh, speaking of other good new new PR, <gasps> Eddie, oh, we got some bluey news happening. For we got some, They're breaking the mold here. They're doing something different. Big bluey news. Um, yes. Well, we just met, by the way, um, a family who has kids our age, had never heard of Bluey. <gasps> never heard of Bluey. How? And it was like, what? And they're like, well, I don't know, da, da, da. And like the other kids in the preschool like were decked out in Bluey and we're like, yeah, you should watch a couple episodes of Bluey. It's pretty, <laughs> it's pretty awesome. Maybe try it. Uh, <laughs> so ABC, that is the Australian broadcasting company. Don't get confused here. Okay. Um, and Disney Plus will premiere Ghost Basket on Sunday, April 7th. Mark it on your calendar, folks. Sunday, April 7th, setting off Bluey's first global rollout event. Uh, it will have a traditional runtime of seven minutes. So we get a globally released episode of Bluey episode. all around the world. One episode. They're just releasing one episode entitled Ghost Basket on Sunday, April 7th. But then a week later, so you just got to wait one more week on April 14th, an episode entitled The Sign, but it's not an episode. It's a special event, 28-minute Bluey extended episode. Wow. That also is going to be launched across the like globe. A short film. Simultaneously. 28 minutes of Bluey. Ah, can you handle that's four it? Epi- that's four episodes, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it's like three and a half. Yeah, yeah. Man. I love how the exception of two countries, one being China and one being New Zealand. <laughs> of course, well, they would a- just be like, stick it to the New Zealanders who, who are right next door. Right. Right. Ah, we're not going to let them have it. So, yeah, so mark your calendars, Bluey families. You've got some exciting news on the horizon. Uh, and I mean, this is I mean, we're, we're just not too far removed from the second half of season three being released. Um, I mean, we're still deeply processing through all of those episodes again. Um, <laughs> Saturdays are still cubby Saturdays. I mean, my kids destroy the house every Saturday. They find every pillow the mattresses make their way into the living room they construct a massive cubby fort uh every saturday i'm excited to finally see that someday in person you haven't seen that episode yet well no at your at, with, with like the the at your place oh the oh the, constructing the, sorry yes 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 see, yes see it see it constructed that would be that would be a lot of fun well, if they're still interested in it, you know how toddlers are. Yeah, they'll be. It's a they'll whole be, new uh, thing. I mean, it's held on this long. It's been a couple years of them holding on to it. So and to Blue, something, yeah. some things never die. Mario and Bluey probably are never dying anytime soon for our families. Just say that. some things never change, and then other things do change, but they are not surprising <laughs> in the least bit. And that is they've that we're finally getting news that. Uh, the fifth Avengers film will not have anything to do with Kang or the Kang Dynasty. It will not be called Kang Dynasty. Uh, we're starting to get rumblings that, yes, in fact, they are going to do something different now that the whole um, Kang, they moving on from the actor, John, uh, uh, the actor and moving in a new direction. Of course, we're not going to have Kang anymore. So all of those cutscenes that mean absolutely nothing now <laughs> to to anything that that we thought was coming uh and then there's also some been some news that they are looking for actors and characters to carry the universe 
first off, that's just a funny thing to say. Like, mm -hmm. characters and actors that have to single handedly carry an entire universe is just a funny phrase that is coming out of my mouth right now. Um, it, it's just funny because that that wasn't necessarily the goal in the first place. It was just make great characters that people love. They didn't have to carry an entire universe. It was like that was the byproduct of building and you finding great actors to fill in here. But what are your thoughts, Eddie? I think they found a money making machine and yes. it broke. And now they it want broke. it back. They want their ATM back. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, they were printing it um, for 15 years, right? That was, uh, that's a solid yep. run. Um, so I think that's what that comes down to is we all knew the, the Kang was going away even before the, the court case was court case was, uh, decided we all walked away from the end of whatever quantum manium was, uh, and that ending going, what, like, is he dead? Is he not like, what are, what are, what, huh? You know, like mm -hmm. very confused. And then that bonus scene where you're like, Okay, well, maybe not then. Maybe there's another one. And uh, and then when he's not mentioned or not, his variant is significant in the second season of Loki. Um, but then the ending, like the last few episodes, he just kind of disappears, right? Um, you're going, oh, okay, yep, yep. They were quickly pushing that to the side and and trying to find something else there. So I'm okay with that. I, again... Hope this means we're getting away from the multiverse. Not been that a fan be of great. this. I hope that this is something a whole new direction. I think that would be fantastic. Um, did we talk about Fantastic Four last week? No, we didn't. Ah, there's another big chunk of news that we didn't we didn't talk about. Um, yep. So uh, Disney or Marvel Studios released on Valentine's Day, so just last Wednesday. Um, that there was that just last Wednesday or was that further back? I don't know now. Uh, Fantastic Four that they announced it's going to be Pedro, Pedro Pascal, Vanessa Kirby, Eben Moss Bakre, and Joseph Quinn as the four in the Fantastic Four. Also, all of the releases and graphics have a very distinct. 60s styling to it which yeah. is the year that the comic came out which has got a lot of people buzzing is marvel going to make this a period piece a lot of rumors going around about that which i think i would be in favor of i think that's always been one of my favorite aspects of the marvel universe is that the movies themselves have some type of genre flair to them that they're more than just a superhero movie that there's some type of of genre flair to it so i'd be okay with um, um a period piece like that give me vibes to wandavision which i have very sure. fond memories of so if they want to resurrect some of that nostalgia probably probably Go not a bad it. idea especially for for the world that they're living in right now so when is that movie coming out is that 2026 2025 do you remember eddie what when the release date is um, it will Fantastic fly Four. into theaters July 25th, 2025. So next year. Great. Mm -hmm. That had previously um, been held by the Thunderbolts, but they're bumping that out um, as they have just kind of bumped yeah, everything kicked back, back kicked, a little kicked bit. down the can. Yeah. Everything's Here's a question. Here's a question for you, Eddie. Is Elio still happening? Or are they going to shove that into a corner somewhere? So it's funny you bring that up. I haven't been able to prove this. I caught uh, on a, like a public TV here in Costa Rica, a McDonald's ad. And they had Elio toys advertised in a McDonald's ad. Wow. And I just, it flashed by me like within a second. And I looked at him like, hold on. That movie got bumped. Like, what are they doing? And I can't find any proof. Like, I haven't been able to reproduce that. So, um, 
it made me go, oh, I wonder if they had already started making the toys. Uh, and now they're going, uh, let's get rid of these things. Let's push them out because we're not sure this is going to happen. But yeah. So it's still currently supposed to come out in 2025, June 2025, but um, which is the new release date that they had given after it got pushed with all the SAG um, uh, strike stuff. And but I don't. They just had the big release with all the, and they really highlighted all of the sequels that were going to be coming out: Moana, to Inside Out, Inside Out Two, Two. etc., uh, Toy Story, and Frozen. But they completely Five. avoided Elio talking at all, and that's what just made me wonder. I don't think they would like completely shelve, like get rid of a film that they had basically already come close to finishing. But it is kind of odd that they are so completely tight. And it's funny also because there's already a trailer. There's already the teaser, the several trailers for it, for it. So yeah, it's got to be no, pretty well advanced. I think it's going to happen. I think there tr- there is a lot of soul searching across the company, but particularly at Pixar. Um, I think it's interesting that they're they. They're in the middle of re-releasing all the pandemic films and putting them out into theaters, giving them their theatrical run. I think Turning Red is out right now. Luca will come out here uh, next in like two, three weeks. It's like mid-March. Um, so I think they're trying to figure something out right now, right? They're they're definitely recalibrating. Um, I wonder, I think the pushback of Elio and uh, was more about pulling forward inside out too in my opinion i think the the big decision there was we need a win we desperately just need a box office win for pixar inside out's a tried and true franchise this is something fans have been asking for bump it forward elio can wait we need the win i think that's what's going on they just didn't want another movie to miss in in theaters and so they're like let's bump forward uh i think it's more about bringing forward inside out than bumping back Elio. makes sense so that's just my opinion it's not like i'm a disney historian or anything like that though i pretend to be one (laughs) play one on tv yes so before we go, uh, you know, JB, I hope you guys have a, a good week. Anything on the horizons for you all? Uh, just barely uh, made it uh, here tonight uh, because uh, my son had soccer practice starting at 7 o'clock, getting over at 8 o'clock at night. What are what? we doing, guys? Why is this so... This feels Kids super late. Kids should be in bed at this hour. I mean... My my daughters were already in bed when we when we when we got back. Like I'm, I'm like, how did how why did someone think this was a great idea? I know that the field has lights on, but it was cold, windy. Like most kids should be like starting to calm down. I don't know if your family does that, where it's like, okay, guys, we need to calm down. Do the wind down. Yeah. And he was like running full speed, like moments before we're getting in the van to then head home to get jammies on and go to bed. Uh, so I don't know why, why the practice is what it is. In one in one instance, it is nice because it doesn't interfere with dinner. Like we can go and have dinner, then have a little bit of time, then go to practice. But still, I I don't know. I still feel like it's super late. I think now that you've completed another trip around the sun, you're primed for Thank a you. good old old man rant on somebody. You need to <laughs> kids shouldn't be staying up this late. I think yeah, I think I think this There's is circadian the circadian rhythm. There's circadian yes. rhythms. Yeah. And you gotta you gotta bust out your pirate voice for that one. Not I, on my I don't own. talk in a pirate voice. <laughs> oh Ed. <laughs> Yeah, so that's 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 what I'm grappling about this week is the super late soccer practices that are interfering with my podcasting abilities. I think that's what this um, this segment should be is like, what are we griping about this week? Let's just let's embrace the fact that we're getting older uh, and, and do that. What you're not mentioning is that we had a bump back recording by one whole night because 
I've been trying to get my driver's license here for four months, trying to get an appointment for four months. Finally get an appointment, but it's in a city two and a half hours away. We decide like, oh man, I don't want to, let's just make this a little bit of a family adventure. You know, we found a cheap deal in a hotel that's got a pool. So we went over yesterday, spent the night. I wake up in the morning, walk over to the license branch. And this should be simple. Like, here's my American driver's license. Here's all of this. And they should just convert it to a Costa Rican one. I'm missing one piece of paper, one no. document that there's no way I could have known ahead of time that I needed this. The guys were just like, oh, this one little, so this means you need this. And I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. And I'm like, can I do this online? No. Can what? I, is there, no. And the guy's like, you need, you need to get this paper and then come back here. Because I'm like, can no. I go to another license branch that's closer to me? He goes, no, you originated this whole process here, so you've got to do it here. He goes, but the good news is you don't need another appointment. And I'm like, great, because I waited four months for this one. Uh, so I, I uh, yeah, all of that for not nothing. I've got the process going. The paper, this was my favorite. I said, well, how long is it going to take me to get this paper? And he goes, well, it takes about seven weeks but today doesn't count, nor do Saturdays or Sundays and most Fridays. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> so when am I getting this? I have no idea. So three, this like is the two, three more months. Uh, just And they'll, they'll WhatsApp me this document, apparently. And then I print it and then take it. I'm like, so you're going to WhatsApp me, but I can't WhatsApp you this document. I have to print it and walk it in in person. Uh huh. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. So there's my old man gripe for the day. So I've got to. I've got to make this trip again. I got to go drive two and a half hours, hand the paper, and then drive two hours back. Two and a half hours back. So here's my question: You currently have a car, are currently driving don't said ask, car. D- don't ask this question. Don't ask this question. Okay. Um, my lawyer told me to. Well, I'm in, I'm in, I'm in process is what she told me. She was like, if anybody asks you any questions, you are in process. You're not legal, but you're also not illegal. Do we need to cut this out? Do we need to cut this out of the podcast so you don't get, uh, I doubt it. I doubt anybody is listening to this, but yeah, there, that there's my life. There's, there's things I, I'm sorry, Eddie. Figuring out. But with that. So Lewis goes, can I, can we go swim in the pool again? (laughs) Of no <laughs> you're gonna just run straight there and give it to him that's like when my marriage license got slightly wet around the fringes of the paper yeah and i had to I drive it. two hours to go get uh a new document signed by our officiant to then and then drive it back to that was fun mm-hmm. i, I mm-hmm. thoroughly enjoyed that it was barely wet but anyways Well, that's enough about us. With that, you've got your weekly dose of Disney nostalgia. Be sure to subscribe to Honey, We Made a Disney Podcast wherever you listen to your other favorite podcast and give us a look on YouTube as well. While you're there, please like or leave a five-star review and share it with your best friend. You can check us out at honeywemade.com where you can see all of our other nostalgic reviews of Disney movies. Tune in next week as we review Lady and the Tramp. Thank you for listening. And remember, M-I-C-K-E-Y-M-O-U-S-C. You did the long version. (laughs) Well, I did the, the goodbye version. That's the goodbye version. The goodbye version. Well, goodbye. 